Thank you. I hope you had some fantastic um, breakout group discussions and enjoyed the tea and coffee um, and virtual tea and coffee for those online. Um, I, before we go into the feedback groups, I hope that you've all got something interesting to say about what you discussed or what you learned. Um, Charles is going to prime us and, and get our brain thinking about, about it before we start feeding back. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, there's going to be a session at the end. After the feedback from the from the groups, we're going to have a roundup session at the end to, to reflect on what we've learned today. So I'm really keen for that to be an active session. And so please listen to the feedback from the feedback groups in an active way. And I'm going to be asking you, not just there's going to be a panel, but they're not going to speak very much because you are going to be, please, online as well. We're going to have, have online in using the comments bar. Um, but from the room, I might well, very much well pick people individually. So please be prepared for that. Um, but just to reflect where we started today was, the, was with Tilly and with Paul kind of setting the scene. And, so, and, and they gave us a, a context to think about where the shelter sector is in terms of climate change. And I'd like to, to, to figure out how we know what we know now, how that fits into that framework. So please be please you know, think about what it is from these feedback groups and think about what you'd like to say and contribute towards the final session, because we will be welcoming your comments. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, so hopefully everyone has their thinking caps on. So we are going to do the feedbacks from the morning breakout groups as well as the afternoon breakout groups. Um, so would somebody, oh, I already have people here. Would Kate from um, Breakout Group 1, Clee Crawford, please, <laughs> please come up and give us a summary of um, how your session went this morning. How many minutes do people have? Five. You have five minutes to sum up what I assume is a very interesting discussion. So breakout group one, we had um, uh, Jim Robinson from NRC, we had Lucy L from IIED, and we had um, um, Stella um, Capri, I hope I've said that right, um, from UCL. Uh, what uh, was um, really interesting about that particular um, collection of um, people on the panel is that we were able to talk about um, real examples of housing, land and property um, dynamics, let's say, I, I, it, just the context, I'll use that word, in Somalia, in the Solomon Islands, um, in Freetown and in Dar es Salaam, and in Northern Lebanon and in Northeast Syria. And what's really nice when you're talking about really specific cases is you get a really deep and rich look at some of the um, factors that are um, driving uh, migration um, and in particular we talked um, about uh, within city migrations and the idea that um, migration itself is like an ongoing um, journey um, which is part of the um, uh, ch uh, challenge from the humanitarian sector's point of view in terms of um, what we call, what Lucy called um, anticipatory action. Um, so uh, I'm gonna flag some of the highlights because I learned um, a lot from the, the sessions. Um, the, ideas around so one of the really staggering photos was um a place in the solomon islands i think called Wolande. i hope i've got that right but um it was being encroached upon by water and the um, land uh, rights were um customarily uh, drawn up so there wasn't necessarily lots of paperwork documenting people and when it became impossible to stay there um a migration happened um, to another island where there's a little bit more space and became then an informal settlement. And you could see um, the, the challenge of returning when it wasn't clear um, exactly how much land was going to be left and who it would, who what was left would belong to. It was really um, staggering. I'm not sure if I've captured that story as well as it was put to us by Jim. But um, the other um, question that Lucy put to us was, um, 
they've been doing very detailed research um, talking to people who have migrated, finding out where they've come from and uh, where they were born and where they've come from. So their last stopping off point, what, what, where they plan to go next. And the research can now take two directions. One is to um, go back um, to the places of origin and find out what is driving people to move. And the other option is to um, look at what's um, the dynamics of the inter of the migration within the city and the local um, research partner of IAD are interested in the second option and um, it seemed there was a bit of a trend in the audience to be more interested in the first option but um, lots of uh, interesting work we think will follow on from that and um, the other um, thing that I personally found very interesting was the um, detail about the um, politics and some of the problems of or the limitations of the labeling systems that international law gives us so the legal protections that depend on whether you qualify you are categorized as a refugee whether you're categorized as migrant um, whether you moved at a certain point in time um, determines which kind of cat protection category you fall into um, and um, Estella gave us a really great um, uh, context on what that has meant for um, populations in northern Lebanon and northeast um, Syria. Um, and she made a really interesting point that the way the story has been told, or at least researched, uh, means it's very much more focused on kind of conflict and it's and religion um, and um, identity rather than some of the resource questions. And she called that a kind of exceptionalism in the way that um, it's, it gets written up and, and the story of that gets told that um, uh, we miss a lot of the story about water resources. We miss a lot of the story about dam building, um, about water that flows um, between different countries across boundaries in the Middle East and what that has meant for displacement, what it means for deforestation and what it means for hazards as well. So. Um, we had some great questions. We had some questions about the Kampala Convention. I hadn't heard of it and suggest you look it up. It's, um, I think others will know more, but it's about um, the rights of people who've been internally, who are migrating internally. And we talked about host communities. We talked about um, the study of immobility, the people who are not able to migrate and who are stuck um, and what, uh, what that might mean. And we talked to, and there were comments about this idea of how migration is described. Um, as a crisis from a European perspective and that these interventions were not to try and stop movement. We've been moving for thousands of years, but simply to um, try to understand more. So it was a great session. Thank you very much to everyone who participated. Thanks, Kate. That was a great summary. Um, okay, so on to Sue for your breakout group. Uh, thanks, Amelia. Um, I didn't think I, I didn't think I'd sort of scroll down the program to see that this um, little session was coming up. So um, uh, yeah, so thanks to people that joined us for um, the session on uh, climate change, uh, shelter, and health. Um, we started off with a bit of a slightly live, lively debate um, uh, between uh, a, a couple of people about some of the sort of uh, definitions um, and some of the some of the ways that climate change is um, possibly framed but anyway we, we moved we moved uh, swiftly on um, from that and uh, um, so we heard from um, Tilly again who picked on some of the things that uh, she wanted to sort of highlight about um, some of the the health um, aspects of um, that related to uh, shelter and climate change and also Michaela um, talked about some of the sort of the ways that inclusive design um, was particularly important to be uh, built into any you know any any response to she was making the point that you know even more than normal we we sort of can't be affording to sort of uh, un unpick and rebuild again if if the ways that um, uh, building in houses but also sort of settlements was um, was not um, accessible um, not inclusive um, she was sort of referring for example to sort of um, uh drainage systems or houses on plinths which simply aren't accessible um to people um uh and um 
uh, and what we intended for the for the uh, session to be sort of more of a discussion. We didn't have a sort of series of of presentations. So we we discussed some of the ways that um, we should be moving forward. Um, we talked a lot about how the right to adequate housing was possibly a way to sort of get over the problem of the sort of the silos thinking about um, the, 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 the often the, the division between shelter and wash, for example, which meant that um, in lots of circumstances, emergencies, but also in longer term um, transitional recovery settings that um, people just simply don't have access to um, safe and adequate um, toilets, for example. Um, and so perhaps to frame, rather than thinking about shelter and latrines, we were thinking about homes that, of course, have, um, have, have, have toilets. Um, and so whether it's sort of adequate housing and thinking about well-being outcomes rather than the outputs from a shelter programme and the outputs from a wash programme, which are separate, um, possibly to think about adequate housing um, and well-being, health and well-being outcomes for people was was a way to 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 sort of try and move move on um so the language although we can get sort of stuck in language sometimes actually it is important because um you know if we start to think about what someone's home um means um and uh, how people's home and their living environment is related to their physical and mental health then if, you know of course we start to think about um you know people living in homes um with adequate sanitation with protection from vectors um uh, and also thinking about air quality and the sort of the win-wins. If we think starting to think about clean energy, um, that's got you know all sorts of wins around climate change and also health, um, air quality, etc. Um, so what have I missed, people that were in the room, in terms of the sort of takeaways? We didn't come up with any overarching solutions, but um, yes, wash wash full sheltering was it? yes. Alan's um, suggesting that perhaps we need to sort of the next report is. Your, your, that was your suggestion, wasn't it, Alain? Uh, washful sheltering, um, moving on from mindful sheltering um, as a way to sort of join these things up together. Um, I think that was it. Hello. So um, yes, in our group, uh, we had we had some really uh, we had a really kind of eclectic discussion about um, um, I can't remember what the exact title was, but it was kind of case studies and, and kind of lessons from research. So um, yeah, serendipitously, I think the order of the speakers went sort of took us from this very broad kind of grand um, ideas uh, about how we're to organize ourselves down like down through to quite granular specific examples at the end um, in relation to kind of um, uh, regeneration sustainability um, and kind of working with communities so to start with we had Juliet from Realliance and she she showed us this video in, in South Sudan uh, this very kind of um, left a, a kind of mark in my mind of this road and you had a dike and on one side they had it flooding uh, completely uninhabitable land and on the other they had extreme drought and like insane temperatures uh, deforestation and uh, basically uh, you know describing the, the 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 situation to the point of kind of inhabit habit uh, in hospitable environment you can't you you know when in a situation like that you don't even have the foundation to start thinking about shelter and that kind of link between the environment being the foundation for all, all you know the entire kind of umbrella under which we even conceive of our kind of role um, and so that need for the integration of humanitarian with the environmental response and she talked about moving from sustainability to regeneration so that's talking about more taking a systemic look at how we uh, conceive of uh, humanitarian and uh, kind of environmental responses so everything from kind of flood resistant crops to early warning so a very, a very kind of broad scope of what those interventions could entail but I think it was that that idea of looking at the problem systemically um, I think was really important and I think that uh, she explained how uh, uh, real answer uh, funding several of these kind of regenerative response pilots which sound like they're going to be really fascinating and they're going to be developing a whole set of guidelines and courses based on that so that's something I'll really be tuning into when that all comes out um, and then also, I, I really like she 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 rebranded DRR as Design for Resilience and Regeneration, which I think is a really nice rebranding of that. So that linked through to Eva's um, presentation on empowering communities to develop sustainable solutions, where she started by saying, you know, um, you know, when we look at greening the response, obviously we have to evaluate, 
every element of our programming and how we're how we're agreeing specific um, you know the specific components of our interventions. But beyond that. Will our interventions be sustainable? Will they be taken forward? Will they be regenerative uh, into the future? And I think her answer to that was that was that the the kind of uh, the the kind of lifeblood of these projects has to be community engagement because ultimately it's it's that engagement with the communities that will take these lessons and this experience forward. And, and uh, so she kind of used phrases like let's let's finally talk with them. Let's make people the communities heroes, not victims. And let's finally sit down together to discuss, which I think is like an age, age old kind of lesson we need to keep relearning. And then also sort of tying into the regenerative, regenerative message was uh, the, the kind of uh, always kind of beautiful analogy of, uh, we have to be more like bamboo. We have to grow together. We have to be strong. We have to be flexible to, so that we can co-design sustainable solutions. And then that nicely tied onto my final presentation where I kind of gave a, a kind of case study of how we put that into practice how CARE put that into practice in Timor-Leste. Um, and the way sort of, uh, we put community engagement so far in the forefront of the project in, in line with a lot of the, the work that we do on self-recovery was to really focus on localizing as much as possible every element of this um, flood response. So we, we localized uh, context analysis and risk assessment, making sure it was gendered and disaggregated, not losing any uh, perspective of any different group of people. Um, we we were also localizing how we uh, how um, how the prog the programmatic um, elements were also conceived and put together by empowering communities to develop project proposals themselves, giving them more agency to uh, run their own programs, but also um, supporting them with it, uh, giving them more information so they could make informed choices. And then finally, we also um, um, realized through this project, uh, through some of the fantastic work that Care Team Molesti did, that we, sh we can work more with local engineers, illustrators, communicators, and uh, you know, um, local people can be the ones leading to develop these kind of shelter key messaging, the IEC materials. It shouldn't always be coming from the top um, you know, and made by glossy kind of graphic designers. We can, we can work more um, and there's so much kind of knowledge and, and, and Kind of a richness of knowledge there that we need to engage with and by humbling ourselves and, and learning the lessons that uh, that eva had explained um and so yeah finally to sum it all up i think um this it was this idea um that if uh, we want to engender this kind of environmental sustainability and regeneration in the work um we kind of to, between the three of us we kind of made this link that it has to come through a kind of a humble um, community-led, community-empowering uh, approach, which, yeah, I think that's about it. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to hear from Sneha, um, who was hosting the online group. Um, and so she's going to give an online video to explain what happened in her breakout group. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to those who had uh, joined uh, the session uh, on lessons. I'm not showing the screen. But they can hear her. I think it's fine. They don't need to see it. Um, practice and research. It was a completely online session uh, that I had the pleasure to chair. Uh, we had five presentations in this group and some really wonderful discussions. It's really unfair to be able to summarize all of them uh, in five minutes, but I'll try my best. Uh, the first uh, presentation was by Mazen, who actually... Uh, Sorry. Yeah, it does need to be louder. Uh, ...provided us an uh, example uh, from Lebanon of Save the Children's Work, uh, where... Uh, both fire uh, seems to be quite uh, prominent during uh, hot weather conditions. Uh, they provided uh, an explanation of two solutions, both an internal kit, which is smaller in size for household level, and an external kit, uh, where both of them proved to be quite useful in maintaining privacy, in ensuring that there was delay in the spread of fire by almost uh, 16 minutes to 10 seconds. Um, 
and uh, there were discussions uh, later on around the cost of the unit and how cheap and how useful these are being even in other conditions as well and what are the benefits in terms of insulation as well i hope um, the second presentation was uh, by uh, Malal, where uh, they presented the work done by Conservation International uh, in building Madagascar, where they tried to map the exposure, vulnerability, and capacity of traditional houses. And uh, they actually made a comparison uh, across hazard sensitivity and adaptive capacities uh, using different uh, data sets that they had collected across the coastal areas and the highland areas. So that was really interesting to me. Uh, we presented a time series uh, in terms of hazards. We presented a time series of different wind capacities and how it differed for these areas. And then went on to talk about how behavioral practices in shelter actually uh, added to the vulnerability or enhanced the capacity. So for example, they provided uh, instances of self built houses and how our uh, traditional knowledge was actually useful in ensuring that the local risks was actually uh, mitigated through these traditional practices. Um, and then using a matrix, they were able to uh, describe the adaptive capacities across these properties. Um, third, presentation was actually quite wonderful and not longing by Farhad Chaudhary from Bangladesh, who actually gave us a very useful and a positive example from the Rohingya camp, where female uh, Rohingya members were actually uh, encouraged and trained and uh, undertook uh, construction of shelters in the camps. Uh, through use of pictures and uh, anecdotes, they actually provided uh, a very positive uh, process and mechanism through which uh, engaging these uh, female volunteers uh, was able to push the social cultural norms bit by bit, where eventually, uh, uh, initially they were working in the fingers, but eventually they were able to uh, work across uh, different genders, both male and female groups were able to work together for constructing shelters. Uh, then uh, we had a presentation by Anna, where she talked about uh, climate change adaptation uh, in uh, Honduras and they described the work undertaken by Bill Chain, Bill Change. Uh, and uh, the last presentation was by myself, where I uh, talked about uh, the role of shepherd cluster, the role of housing and uh, communal infrastructure, and how. Uh, communities in South Sudan who are facing multiple risks where it, uh, trying to prioritize the destruction of a dike uh, to protect themselves from recurring floods every year. Uh, but in the absence of uh, external support, uh, what resources and challenges they faced uh, in even uh, ensuring safe settlements and communities to live in because these areas are still water. Um, Thank you so much. I hope uh, this is not a long video. I look forward to more discussions in the plenary. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so we had a, uh, a discussion on um, inclusion in the humanitarian shelter sector. And um, we looked at, uh, we had expertise who uh, experts who focused on on all sorts of different uh, protected characteristics, and um, sort of looked at the question, you know, why uh, Im implicitly uh, why are folks excluded? And we looked at unintentional, uh, you know, reasons why people are overlooked when we're we're trying to provide assistance, and then actual very deliberate exclusion. Um, enacted through, you know, law of uh, of a given host government, and where it's actually extremely uh, risky to directly go out and try and provide assistance to folks where what we might call a protected characteristic, in some parts of the world, is an actively outlawed uh, part of of a person's identity. So, um, I guess we 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 looked at the fact that it is 
really difficult to achieve intersectional targeting. Um, and, you know, the, the, the successes that we've, that folks have seen in including people tended to be where projects were very deliberately inclusion specific programming. Um, and much less so in, in broader multi-sectoral or single sector specific programming. Um, and we, we saw, and that isn't even true for folks of uh, diverse sexual orientation, gender identities, expressions, and, and sexual characteristics, where there was almost zero evidence of, of good quality uh, inclusion. Um, and so we looked at, I guess, two, two main areas of, of where we can do better as a, as a, as a group of um, practitioners and academics and um, folks who don't fall into either category. Um, and they are in targeting and having better lists and indeed, uh, you know, covering off some of those uh, methodologies like, you know, using the, the, the Washington group of questions um, and and targeting more, really more deliberately within a, a larger beneficiary list is sometimes actually plays right into, into causing harm. And so working through, through proxies or interlocutors like uh, sort of campaign groups on behalf of, um, of disabled folks or women's groups or groups you know, dedicated to support of, of people who are older, um, and so on. And then, then there's also the, the policy side, which is an area which continues to evolve, but neither of which are really going to be the answer to this. And I think, you know, it's, policies are, are a start, but um, change and improvements in, in our sector really benefit from models. And so it was um, where there were examples, it was, uh, it was good to hear those. And they came from the panel made up of Dr. Maria Kett, Haley Cap, and Kevin Blanchard, uh, who I give great thanks to. And I would also say that we had some really good inputs from the audience as well. An incomplete list, but uh, Elon Kelman, Dave Ray, Tom Newby, Kate Crawford, and Michaela. Well, I can't see where she is, but she's about, I'm sure. Um, but uh, yeah, big thanks to them as well. And if anyone is still interested in, in this sort of growing area, I would strongly commend to you, uh, firstly, a publication called The Only Way Is Up by UN Women and Edge Effect. And of course, uh, Dr. Maria Kett is very soon going to be publishing a piece of work very relevant to our sector. So thank you. Uh, that's it from me. Cheers. Um, Seb, you're up. <laughs> Wait, thank you. So um, yesterday we had a, uh, a full day workshop uh, exploring the use of low, low impact materials. And that was also the theme of today's breakout session uh, where we fed back those findings. So when we say low impact materials, what do we mean? We're talking about traditional materials such as bamboo, timber, soil, stone. Um, and we've also included the reuse of plastic waste, which isn't really a low impact material, but we're still trying to reduce the impact. So we've, we've brought that in together. Um, yesterday focused on soil, bamboo and plastic waste, because that's what, that's what we heard from um, the, uh, the shelter sector. Those are the presentations which were offered, but obviously the other materials are very relevant. Um, now we all know all these materials are uh, well, except for the plastic. The other way, the other materials are all very appropriate because they tend to have a low holistic environmental impact, um, and they all tend to be traditional materials. I don't think anyone's arguing that it's good if we can use more of these low impact materials and less of plastic. So the the aim of yesterday and today wasn't to focus on that because I think we're all sold on that. It's how can we actually scale up the use of low impact materials, and how can we use less plastic. So we had great presentations yesterday from um, uh, around nine different organizations with different experience from across the world. So really good contexts, a really good different um, a variety of different experiences and contexts. And that gave us lots of food for thought. And there were some really good case studies about scaling up, but scaling up is definitely a challenge. So the questions that we posed yesterday and today 
firstly, what are the barriers towards scaling up? And some of those barriers definitely occur across different materials. And secondly, how do we overcome those barriers? Just very quickly, some of the barriers we came up with, there's definitely a perception problem, lots of low impact materials such as bamboo and soil. Um, knowledge, we do have knowledge, but it's not perfect. And some of it, there are, there are some misconceptions, there are some gaps, some of it can be hard, hard to find. Industrial pressure is definitely a problem. Material availability, uh, there are political pressures as well, funding constraints. Ego is an interesting one. We're taught as practitioners to try and reinvent the wheel. Sometimes that's not always a good thing. Sometimes it, research can be good, but sometimes these traditional materials and techniques can be equally good, if not better. Um, and, for, and lastly, money. How do we overcome these? We came up with a few ideas, breaking the barrier of perception, uh, precedence. If there's good precedence, we can start to break that down. So starting to build mid, high-end housing and buildings with these materials, um, that sets a good, a good standard against which gives people confidence um, in terms of breaking down the knowledge barrier, codes, guides, training courses, material availability, considering, considering a circular economy can help, doesn't solve the problem, but it helps a little bit. Political and funding constraints, these are big barriers. Lobbying. So if we can do more lobbying and if we can influence those key stakeholders, uh, that would really help a lot. Uh, to solve the ego problem, we need to change our approach and think that existing materials and techniques should be seen positively. Um, so what are the next steps? So we talked about how can we actually build upon this? So first we want to create some sort of network. We haven't exactly decided how, um, but some sort of network to share knowledge. Um, and we've got just down there, um, Lauren's email address. Um, so if you're interested, please do reach out to Lauren, lauren.walter at arab.com. Can we put it on the chat? This might be a low tech way of <laughs> getting it to the people at home. So this is just to collate a, um, an email address upon which, well, on which we will build some sort of network. We haven't decided yet, but there's lots of different ideas. Um, some possible um, ideas to come out of that are technical working groups to share guidance and see where the gaps are. Um, and also working papers, donor briefing notes. Um, that's also um, an idea. So we're going to start to see what we can, what we can write to um, really influence some, some of the key stakeholders. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. That's fine. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We can copy and paste the email. I'll copy and paste the email yeah, into the thing. It, oh, super. All of these little elves helping in the background. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Um, is Shams in the room? Yes, you are. Super. Are you happy to take the lead and I'll fill in any blanks? That's fine. Okay. You can jump in. Brilliant. Lots of nuts. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, Four minutes. All right. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I think uh, let me introduce myself. I wasn't here. Apologies. Yesterday. Uh, uh, my name is Mohammed uh, Shams uh, I prefer Shams. I'm uh, associate professor in humanitarian science at ECL Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction, in short, IRDR. Uh, I'm leading uh, a, a new BSc program uh, at the institute called global humanitarian um, studies. So um, Amelia and I um, facilitated uh, breakout uh, option three on technological and digital solutions. We had um, uh, quite a few people uh, attending uh, that breakout session. We had three uh, fascinating, wonderful presentations. Uh, I was very pleased uh, to see uh, two uh, very enthusiastic, uh, brilliant PhD students, uh, Anna uh, Konzati and uh, Elif Kasser from the University of Bath. And they talked about their um, research, which is around um, monitoring air quality in uh, refugee settings. Um, and they, uh, for their research, they use different uh, sensors and uh, to collect uh, data, and then they use uh, computer models to, to simulate um, so that they can kind of scale up and provide um, information um, um, whenever um, anyone um, is asking to get any information about air quality um, around the world. So their innovation is about um, a mobile phone app. Um, sorry, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, okay. Um, and then uh, the the next uh, second uh, talk was uh, given by 
Um, Natalia uh, Watanabe, I think I get the name right, from uh, NRC. And that talk was about um, energy um, supply in um, refugee ca uh, camps, uh, particularly in uh, Azraq uh, camp in Jordan. And the innovation is about how to provide kind of equitable electricity for refugees and control electricity through um, a, a kind of a digital um, uh, controller um, called feeder and prioritize primary energy use from the secondary energy use so that the refugees can actually prioritize their use and to optimize the use because in refugee settings, they don't get electricity um, uh, 24 hours uh, a day. So they need to prioritize. So through their innovation, um, um, uh, Natalie um, uh, um, uh, could uh, say to us that uh, uh, the refugee uh, camps in, in, in Jordan, Azraq uh, camp, they were able to use that uh, uh, device and, uh, and they uh, were quite happy with the kind of improvement. So the final um, talk we had from uh, Michael Wall and I think Alexandra uh, Karivu uh, Burke, if I can name the, uh, remember the name correctly. And their innovation is about, again, um, a mobile application, uh, but specifically uh, targeting around the kind of gap um, in, um, in tenancy agreement in, uh, uh, kind of again humanitarian setting and they uh, their innovation they developed in Jordan where they found a huge gap between uh, a private owner and then the tenancy um, in terms of uh, you know lack of um, information and accessibility to information um, amounting to um, lo huge loss of um, people's hour, working hour. So their innovation is trying to save uh, not only time, but also save, um, also reduce carbon emission. Uh, then we, we had a um, uh, open discussion and the takeaway messages are basically that access to digital information can empower uh, local populations, particularly refugees for decision-making. But uh, the other takeaway message is that um, often with the digital uh, technologies, uh, sometimes um, uh, there is a kind of hype and uh, we don't necessarily think about the local context. Uh, so the final um, message I think we talked about is that uh, we have to be very careful about um, uh, privacy and access to information and security and so forth. So that's all from the uh, breakout session. Thank you. Hello. Is it working? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm uh, presenting the plenary, but I was not the host of this session. <laughs> it was Elisa, but she's not in person, so I'm talking her, on her behalf. Uh, yeah, the session was Shelter Projects and Climate Change, as Charles mentioned this morning. Uh, the objective of this session was to um, uh, answer the questions, the key questions of the forum with the key essential messages of the shelter projects. And um, yeah, the shelter projects essential, as Charles mentioned, is a publication that was launched last year, and it is a compilation of 12 key messages that are repeated over and over in good shelter practices. Um, so we have the three questions from the forum. The first one, do we have the capacity to respond to rising humanitarian needs while redu redu reducing vulnerability to longer term shocks and stresses? For this question, uh, the message selected was K, message K, good projects reduce the impact of future shocks. Uh, for this, Amaya Selaya from UN Habitat uh, presented a case study about resilience in the urban, urban environment in Siberia. And she highlighted the problems of uh, using concrete and other common building techniques and um, instead of traditional wood used in the region and the consequences of melting permafrost in foundations. Then the second question uh, of the forum, which is, do we have the skills to understand and incorporate the risk analysis into our programs alongside local and indigenous knowledge? 
we had the honor of um, Dave Hodkin to answer this question with the message J, uh, locally appropriate technical solutions work best. Uh, Dave uh, introduced the importance of vernacular techniques and how as architects, we should, in, we should aspire to the role of facilitator and promoter of existing practices instead of imposing. Uh, also, uh, he emphasized uh, the need to learn from the practice that work and try to evolve and adapt to the setting. And then uh, the third question uh, of the forum, uh, how can we minimize the damage that we cause to the environment while providing timely and principal humanitarian assistance? Uh, we selected the message, I, local environmental damage is long lasting, which was answered by me. And <laughs> I presented, uh, uh, I answered this question, emphasizing the importance of a holistic approach promoting synergies among, among sectors and closing the cycle, the cycle for a sustainable supply chain. Uh, from this discussion, the importance of logistic impacts have come up and also why humanitarian practitioners should be more conscious of the whole process uh, of sourcing. Uh, in conclusion, uh, uh, we as shelter practitioners, considering that climate uh, events will continue to happen. We have to try to adapt and facilitate practices that are there and ensure that the responses consider every step of the shelter process, because indeed shelter is not a product, it is a process. And it should blend into the environment where it is, where it is being implemented. Uh, anything that is done in, in excess, even bamboo, which we know that is sustainable, uh, if uh, it is in excess, it can be devastating for the environment. And we as shelter practitioners should be conscious of the consequences of every deci decision that uh, is taken in shelter programming, including not just the technical aspects, uh, but also soft skills uh, or considerations that will make the practice sustainable for the communities and the environment. Fantastic. Um, thank you for all of the feedback. It sounds like it was all really interesting. We're actually on schedule, which is amazing. Um, unheard of, almost. Um, so we're, we're going to move into a reflection session, which Charles is going to host. Um, we're going to have um, some panelists to speak briefly, but then we're going to have that, you know, big collective reflection together um, to work out what to do next. <laughs> so I'll hand right. over the Can floor. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to put the little microphones on the table. <laughs> um, so who as a victim do for come, the panel? Panelists, do come up. Thank you. And can we turn on comments on the Zoom? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, panelists, for agreeing to be part of this final panel. Um, and we've got a great amount of experience in the room to be able to focus on the question that was set for this UK Shelter Forum. And we want to use this final session to reflect on the day and discuss how we want to represent this UK Shelter Forum and what we've discussed here um, out to, to people who want to know about this issue. So if we were asked the question about climate change, is the shelter sector ready, which is the title of our day, what would we say? And I want to draw everybody's minds back to the initial sessions where Paul and Tilly set the scene for us and gave a way to explore and explain um, a framework around climate change. And so what thinking back to that and thinking back to the sessions that you've 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 talked about and you've been part of and the feedback that's just that you've just heard, what would you conclude? What would you what would you say? What are your takeaway messages? And 
Um, what Paul said, just to remind you, is that is that what messages would you take to humanitarian decision makers? He said, we're not very good at change, managing change. How could we do that better? And what are we doing currently, which is flexible, adaptable, local, and what we should scale up? So what I'd like to do is, is in the last in the last portion, and we won't be late, we'll be on time. Um, so I'm going to close this at, at 525. Um, so I'd just like to make that have that discussion about what we would do. And I'd like to, I'd like to start. Can I just start by going to the audience? And I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask. <coughs> sorry, I'm going to ask Pippi, who as, as a brand new student to this area, to kind of to uh, to reflect on what she's learned during the day as a kind of a new voice in the humanitarian world. And thank you for agreeing. Um, well, on behalf of, I think, my, my peers as well, I think none of us are really aware of how broad this sector is and the challenges that are involved with it. And I think one of the main things that I learned was, or not learned, but kind of the point where everybody kind of stopped and agreed on was this need for funding and how do we engage kind of everyone and how do we move from the everyone agreeing or disagreeing to what is like priorities to how do we get the rest of the world to see that this is a major issue that requires international attention. And I think just based on what we've discussed and what was mentioned in one of the rooms was this idea of simplifying simplifying things, making it applicable to everyone and therefore getting both the younger generations and people who aren't necessarily in this industry to see the importance of what you're doing. Um, because that's, I think that's the way to get the attention that's needed in there, the, the money and, and more innovation and more ideas of how to, how to go about actually getting this change. Yes. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Before I turn to the panel, does anyone have any kind of any burning comments they'd like to make about something that you think is really important that we should have on our agenda for the shelter sector responding to climate change? Tom. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. So, uh, Tom, you again. I feel like I've been talking a lot, but I'd, I, I thought I wanted to build on Lizzie's presentation this morning, which I think was really important, as setting the scene for a key thing here. And it's com it, it's a complex, it's a nuanced point. Um, but um, I'm very wary of trying to make climate change and particularly carbon emissions a really important point in the humanitarian shelter sector. Um, and there's a real danger there of us, the global north, the sector, um, putting this entirely on very vulnerable people. We talked about a lot about inclusion today and very excluded people who have done absolutely nothing to, to cause climate change to happen. And it is not their responsibility to reduce carbon emissions for the rest of the world and what we cannot do is make it more difficult for them to recover to re recover from emergencies to survive emergencies by putting requirements on them to not use concrete or to not um, emit any carbon uh, absolutely we should be making sure that we avoid the environmental degradation around where they're living which because that's a part of their own sustainable future but still with them as the center of what we're trying to do um, so I just, I, I, and I don't have the numbers to this and I'd really like to work with somebody to get the numbers for this, but I have no doubt as I, because I work in construction, I know how much carbon we emit in building buildings in this country, that building emergency shelters is a rounding error in the amount of carbon that's emitted in construction. It is totally insignificant. So we shouldn't be, I, I don't think we should be, even be thinking about it when we're looking at how we respond to emergencies. Um, other parts of environmental 
sustainability, yes, but carbon, we have to be really careful about how we address that. Um, Can I just take that, take that point up a bit? Does anyone have any comments on that? Yes, we've got a comment, two comments here. Hi, um, I'm Jenny Archibald. I'm an environmental advisor for NRC. Um, and that part of my role has been um, supervising our estimation of our, our carbon footprint, um, of which the largest signal contribution is um, construction materials. However, I completely agree with you. Um, it is the biggest portion of our construction material. Uh, portion of our footprint, but not necessarily the first thing that we should be concentrating on reducing it. So we have opportunities to reduce in facilities, in energy, in fleet, which are which don't have an impact on the people that we're trying to serve. And for me, the focus, our focus, our response to, to climate change really should be around what is the, the increased risks that people face? How do we make shelters that um, can withstand the increased uh, weather events and the, the change in temperatures? And how do we respond to increased and prolonged um, displacements due to climate change? And how do we protect local environments from those bigger and more frequent responses. Um, so I think that the, the direct environmental responses in the places where we're working, and particularly from related to shelter responses, is where we should focus. And I say that as someone whose um, job is about reducing our carbon footprint. Great, thank you. Magnus. Thank you. Uh, Tom, that's a great point. I definitely agree with you, but I do want to bring up uh, something um, I read on IOM South Sudan, right? So they had just installed in Malakal, Bentiu, and so on, massive solar arrays to green, a bit like you're saying, to, to green their kind of response. Now, uh, and with that, they were able to bring in some carbon credit organization money to be able to do more training and spread it out. So I think that's a really good example of... Uh, some of the benefits of reducing the carbon footprint there. And if, if we could calculate that and say, ha, ah, um, each time that happens, not just with solar arrays, but with other, say, building uh, materials, be a kind of incentive and, and possibly a good example of it going forward, notwithstanding your point. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna to come to Hilmi online next. Hilmi, do you want to unmute and speak? Hi, thanks. Uh, I, I was going to speak, but Tom exactly spoke uh, what I had in mind even more eloquently, so I'm not going to repeat that point. Uh, a while ago, we did a, a, a back of the envelope calculation. Uber in New York City probably just uh, create more carbon uh, uh, emission than the whole of uh, shelter sector would ever do in a year. So we, we are talking about uh, something, uh, my, you know, pretty much very minuscule amount of uh, stuff compared to the whole of the uh, construction sector, just construction sector, but not, not taking into other, you know, fossil fuel, uh, you know, e everything else. So we, we really need to think about that, how much effort we need to do. But at the same time, I think we can, focus some of the effort in understanding uh, what impede our ability to deliver humanitarian aid, you know, not just for climate change and environment, but in a regular uh, disaster and, and conflict and other things, uh, these impacts may impede our operational uh, uh, efficiency. Uh, because of floods, because you know whatever whatever the impacts are, so I think we do not have at the moment uh, a clear understanding of how our our operation can um, 
we made it more efficient. But second part of that thing is to understand what communities are facing uh, because of this. You know, a lot of people spoke about it. I didn't, uh, I missed some of the, the speech uh, before, but how exactly communities are impacted and what is the kind of decisions the communities make that could uh, either, you know, um, create more humanitarian uh, needs. So the, these two things, I think we can still uh, uh, understand it better rather than you know reducing one one shelter uh, changing material i'm not i'm i'm not saying it is yes or no but it's a questionable uh, thing to think about yeah right thank you hilmi and uh, sneha we see your comment and thank you very much for that um, are, are, are we is it that we've got two things here which are separate and we should separate one is greening the response and one is climate response to climate change and we shouldn't be putting those two things in the same basket. So anyway, let's let's that, that's just occurring to me. Let's just put a pin in that now. Uh, I'm going to Vicky, and then I'm going to turn to the panel. So panel, be prepared. Thank you. Um, so my thoughts with this um, meeting that we've had today, uh, firstly, is that I'm really infused by the amount of enthusiasm of people to respond to the need for improved shelter design and focus on the environmental impacts but also the increased hazards that people are facing in some of the developing countries and the southern nations. Um, but the other thing that I take away is actually we've got the next generation of shelter practitioners here who are talking about us making better use of social networks in order to identify ways of actually gathering funding together in order to be able to find more sustainable solutions and potentially even creating a carbon guilt for the North to try and make people understand that their use of you know, carbon output is actually having this massive impact in some of the areas where in fact, people are not guilty of creating these, uh, these carbon emissions that are causing the issues that they are then facing. And so maybe we need to actually look at it from that point of view and make people understand what they're doing is having this impact elsewhere. That's really interesting. And, and I think we'll probably talk about funding a little bit more. That's one of the things that I take away from this. But let, let's turn to the panel for their responses. Phil, can I turn to you first? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think um, digital humanitarianism is definitely coming on really quickly uh, and, and a really good thing. And yet, a very unregulated space and and we know that well-meaning amateurs can can cause a lot of harm um is that a sketchy way of uh avoiding conversations about moving from 0.7 gni to 0.5 yes it is um and uh this the sector does need more money without a doubt and normally um in my life i'm talking to people trying to convince them about the value of shelter and its foundational uh, attributes in terms of, of health, of livelihoods and protection and on and on. And, and that doesn't happen here. And this, this is a really, really special place. Um, what, uh, what we see as policy in two years from now is discussed here today. That, that's the nature of, of this event is that you get really bright people of who are doing all sorts of incredible things and they come together and they they share it and it's within a year people are talking about it in two years it, it's just natural policy happening everywhere and that's a real credit to the facilitators so i just want to say that quickly the next is that um there's a really good paper out from since 2018 by all map called how change happens in the humanitarian sector and i think really that speaks to the title of, of this year's shelter form, but also that of previous years. It's about how can we be better? Um, and it deals with, with two main th themes, and I'm, it's a long time ago that I read this, but one of them is about guidance, and the other is about generating an almost sort of visceral response to a story, an event, or a moment. And we've had great examples of both of those today. Firstly, 
NRC's uh, environmental minimum, minimum standards that Amelia brought up this morning. And then a number of uh, stories, events, or moments shared. Different ones will resonate with different people. But for me, that video of a flood next to a completely denuded landscape of tree stumps with temperatures of 69 degrees centigrade was just astonishing. And learning that it is not drought that causes bare ground, but uh, bare ground that really causes drought is something that I find um, motivational to me. And I, I know it leaves me with an idea of what my next steps are going to be. Thank you, Charles. Back Great, you. thank you. Lit, can you pass it on to Lizzie? So Lizzie, over to you. And then I'm gonna to come to Jim and then finally to Amelia. Am I just trying to get that on? Does that work? Can people hear? Great, okay. <laughs> Save some fiddling around with it. Um, in answer to the, the question, is the shelter sector ready? I think actually ready is quite a sort of um, finite um, word, but I think there's some really positive things going on. At the beginning of the um, forum, somebody said it was a bit depressing because 20 years ago, we were asking the same questions. Now it's not somebody you know, a single person standing in the corner of the room sort of going on about climate change. Climate change is now the massive issue in our lives. Um, there is now some funding. Um, there is now a UK shelter forum dedicated to climate change. There is space for thought. You know, there are there is opportunity to take next steps forward. So I don't think we need to beat ourselves up too much, <laughs> although a little bit of beating up sometimes helps. And as you say, it, it does move things forward. Maybe just going back to what Paul said at the beginning um, about working, working better together. Climate change seems to be giving us opportunities to work across sectors, uh, across silos, across clusters, because it is such a massive, massive issue. Um, in order to do that coordination positively, one thing I'm hearing is maybe we need to be smarter about partnering, um, more informed about our fundraising. Um, we had a discussion in the uh, inclusion group about how it, difficult it is for specialist agencies to get funding because they don't actually need very much funding. Um, but unfortunately, the way of the world at the moment is that especially larger donors can only give out very large grants. So, there needs to be more partnering happening in order for these more specialist initiatives to be brought to bear on um, the issues that we're facing. The other thing that seems to have come out very strongly throughout the day is about localization and about how most of the answers seem to be with those communities that we work with. But there is something that we need to be doing about actually giving them voice and making sure that the, the knowledge that they have about adapting to their surroundings is passed on to others, um, that we learn from it, um, and also that they have access to the information they need and the resources they need in order to do something about it. So there's a facilitation role for us there perhaps, which is about how we collect data and how we give people access to data, maybe. Just coming on to the, the point that was raised at the beginning about um, carbon and you know, where the focus of the sector might be, it struck me that that conversation might be quite easily framed with the, the first and second um, targets of the Climate Charter. So the first one is more about sustainability and supporting communities to sort of deal with mitigating the effects of climate change. And maybe as a sector, we could get a bit more informed about climate justice, because a lot of the points that are being made, they, they are to do with climate justice. And then the second target, you know, more about sort of reducing emissions, reducing pollution, reducing carbon. Maybe that's less of a priority. Um, 
it's a dangerous thing to say because I don't think that you know all major agencies or donors would agree with that but I think that's that's something interesting to consider going forward but it sounds like from what we've discussed today and what was discussed yesterday there are some great opportunities out there and I think the shelter sector as a sector who, that's engaged in using materials that's engaged in looking at the context and the sites and actually getting its hands dirty and working with communities to move forward from being affected by climate change to more sort of positive adaptations we're well placed Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. No, you can't have it. It's the power. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I mean, amazing insights and reflections. And um, firstly, thank you for welcoming to my first me to my first uh, UK shelter forum. I feel like someone who's a, a visitor, but a very welcome one. So thank you. Um, I think the thing that keeps coming up. That I've heard both last night in the event related to today and today as well are uh, the need to think in systems. I've, I've heard um, talk about readiness, context, risk, predictability, preparedness, planning, and then response, uh, then justice, um, the environmentalism versus humanitarianism. The, the bit where the Venn diagram crossed again was those longer term. Things. And I can't get away from the links that seem to need to be made more and more between humanitarian response and that wider kind of effort to bring about you know, transformation, essentially, that does link into development, but it also links into policy and government. And I think Paul said it this morning, need to get used to being a minor partner. And I thought that was quite profound. And um, and I was trying to think, well, oh, good. I mean, this is what we say quite a lot. And it's so easy to say, but who who convenes this kind of collaborative cross silo response and, and approach? How, how do we get there? Um, and I don't really know the answer to that, but I was trying to think, well, what can we each do? Well, one thing is, you know, can we reach across a silo? What opportunities have we got to uh, engage in a different sector or a different um, part of a response to these sort of climate emergencies and, and different ways of thinking? Um, one thing maybe is, um, I think it was mentioned last night about these sort of regional communities of practice that if we can engage on a local level, because local communities, they do deal with risk and context and preparedness and planning and then response. They, that is where these things all come together. So I wonder if there's some way that we can uh, kind of engage with that more. And then another way to bring about sort of change and kind of inspire that change is, is when we see practice or, or ways of working that does do this, because there are stories. Um, sometimes some of the area-based approaches can have something to learn. Sometimes there can be other examples where we've seen wonderful things happen. How do we get better at telling the stories around that? How do we gather that evidence? How do we prioritize gathering that evidence? I know it's something that my area does not well enough. How do we really get that learning and, and kind of make sure we can kind of get the most from it? Um, and I think there is a, a bigger question that I don't really know how to answer, but is that, you know, where does the humanitarian response begin and end? And, you know, th that question of preparedness and, and development, I, mean, I don't know the easy answer to that, but, but I, I, the sort of instinct is that there's something about local communities who are living and experiencing these things that is, is, is where we can draw on. Um, yeah, so lots of questions. I'd love some answers. So please, please keep, keep bringing them. Um, and just, yeah, thanks for, for having me. Great, thanks, Jim. I'm going to come um, to Amelia, but I'm just drawing your attention to the the, the people online. We've got uh, Hilmi is saying, um, can, where where do our coverage rates sit here? Um, we've got we're barely reaching 15% of shelter in most years. You know, do, does the does the conversation we are having here have any impact on that? We've got some links also in the chat for the, the various things that we've. We've changed, um, we're looking at, Fiona has put in a, a, an opposite link, how change doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> Hilby's put in a local response and George, thank you, George, um, carbon footprinting. footprinting. Um, yes. yes. Um, I, I have a question for Amelia. Oh. Um, in the last session, uh, you said that there are warehouses full of innovations and products that people do not want. Where are these warehouses? What's in them? And can that 
stuff be used constructively if nobody wants them? Maybe we could send it to the Ukraine. Could you please tell me where those warehouses are and where those products are and what they are? And if there's an infantry that the NRC could put together so that they can be used and not thrown away or recycled or whatever, I'd be very interested to hear your response. Thank you. For those online, if you didn't hear that on the mic, um, warehouses full of unused products, is there an opportunity to use them? Um, yes, Amelia, thank okay, you. I think I can build that into what I was going to say. Um, okay, so many things. Um, so this discussion started on Thursday evening and um, not all of you were here, so, but apologies if I repeat anything. Um, I think I, I really agree. I wanted to be a little bit on what, what Tom was saying because the, the, one of the first times, and maybe this shouldn't be the first time, but the first time I was confronted with the dilemma in terms of what our actions are and what can be expected of change in construction practices um, at a community level in a response was in Malawi after Cyclone Idai, where the where it was quite clear that houses, um, Adobe houses that had fired their bricks survived a lot better in the rain and the flooding than Adobe bricks which had not been fired. And Malawi generally, especially at a mass production scale, had, had forbidden the firing of, of blocks. So as a humanitarian, yeah, there was there was constraints on how Tom's looking very confused at me. There was cons no, 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 oh okay, <laughs> you're <sorry>. listening. <laughs> That's just your face, okay. <laughs> okay, there were there were there was restrictions on the types of uh, on the amount of bricks that could be fired. So where does our responsibility lie in doing IEC materials in terms of build back? better and you know what should we be promoting the thing you know do we have the responsibility there to as you're saying Tom sometimes put the responsibility of our carbon footprint on the, the communities that we're working with but I think that we need to not always we need to focus a lot on the process which is why I think actually we can really learn from our activities around greening the response and not focus not put all of our focus on that final product um and also i think there will always be a minimum amount of carbon involved in any shelter response if we focus on construction or or do need to focus on construction and there will be a minimum amount to retain an adequate shelter response but what can we do to make that construction efficient what's the most efficient that we can um that we can do to yeah in in terms of the construction but using using appropriate technologies there will always be the needs <laughs> however efficient and however much we reduce um of the carbon emissions of that project there will always also be the need for energy as well and um, I think this is, was also came across in the presentations today on the digital, some of the digital tools um, about using technology to make sure people are informed about what energy they can use, how much they are using and methods in which they can improve um, their living conditions. So it, I think we need to, I think there has been some hesitancy in the past about looking at one off technological solutions, perhaps digital, we're worried about the scale and, and appropriateness of them. But I think we need to push that uncomfortable, that uncomfortable feeling a little bit. And also think about how we can support and leverage some of these ideas, because we're not going to know if they work in until we test them. Um, but the sorry i'm going off on one um yeah and so i think we need to change and we need to stop we need to be a bit braver in terms of the kind of responses that we do however coming to your comment okay. over there <laughs> 
um, whenever we introduce new new technology which isn't necessarily tied to local vernacular architecture or methods of cooking um, that people are using every day and we introduce new items new products there's a risk that these will not be adopted because it's a top-down mechanism and we haven't necessarily built in aspects of behavior change um, so when I was referring to the warehouses full of products that are not being used, it was anecdotal, but it was an, it's an example of where we have done um, distributions of, you know, particular efficient stoves, which don't tie in to how people cook in that particular region and they're not used, but it. Oh, <laughs> But um, but it's anecdotal. It's anecdotal, but we can talk about it after afterwards. Yeah, but these are desperate people. These refugee camps, you know, they're almost like prison camps, and you know, they'd be grateful for any improvement. Um, we've got to be careful that we don't treat these refugees as prisoners, you know, because they're there for like eight years, and you know, shouldn't you as an organisation be doing more? To put pressure on governments to allocate these refugees rather than treating the, this refugee camp as a holiday camp. That's a really important point. Sorry, could yeah. I ask? Could I? Could I ask who you? We we normally say who we are. Can I ask you to? Thank you. Thank you. That's I, I think that's a really great question, and it's one I don't think we've got time, unfortunately, <laughs> to. To, to cover that whole thing in, in the one minute that we've got left. It is a question we've taken before in these, in these sessions, and I think it's a, it's a great topic for, uh, and we will, I'm sure there will be people available to talk to you about this afterwards, but unfortunately we've got to, we have to conclude this session. <laughs> Amelia, do you want to say any more um, uh, before I bring in yeah. Bill? Uh, all I was gonna say is, we can't do this inside, we can't do this all operating in our own organizations. Um, and we do really need to do this together. And I think I said it last night, but I'll say it again. That I don't, it would be a real shame if adding environment and reducing our emissions and, and working towards stopping climate change, at least in our sector, would be a real shame that if it becomes another tick box exercise or something that we use to compete for, for funding from donors. Um, because it's, yeah, it's not appropriate. We need to work together. We need to have a united front. And I hope that we can start to do this um, a little bit more collectively. Thank you so much, Bill. You've got a point. Can someone, Amelia, could you pass yeah, the microphone sure. over to Bill? Sure. So really quick, if anyone wants to make some final, final comments really quickly, I really want to end at five to five to give Victoria a moment to talk about what's next and what's happening in the future but if, if anyone's got burning things they want to say very very quick sentence like I'll comment try, please. I'll try and be absolutely as quick as I possibly can. Um, talking Tom of uh, trying to put numbers to this the only statistic that I can have and I'm not quite sure where it comes from but I'm quoting Thomas Piketty so I think it's a fairly good source and uh, it's that half the, the world's half the world's population, the poorest half of the world's population, their carbon footprint is so reduced that they have already met their obligations to, to have a, a certain carbon footprint in order to reduce our uh, increase to 1.5 by 2030. So the point that you're making about, and I think the really important thing here for us actually is to really understand the difference between mitigation and adaptation. Um, and so in terms of mitigation, that population, which is most of our the people that, that, that we um, work with, uh, have met it. So there isn't, you know, so when it comes to donkeys and helicopters, for me, helicopters, because it's for us to reduce the helicopters and use donkeys and not that other half of the population. Adaptation on the other hand, definitely, because as we know, we are the polluters and that's the population that's paying the price. So I think the onus on us is to, is to really think hard and long about adaptation, occasionally mitigation, but generally to be really careful about our understanding of those definitions. So I'm actually unhappy with the expression greening the response. 
and I would quite like us to drop it because it, for me, it talks it all about reducing carbon footprints, you know, using sustainable materials, lower, low carbon, you know, I'm not saying those things aren't important and not, not relevant, but they, they shouldn't be like, you know, our target, our target to, yeah, I mean, it's, it comes down to climate, climate justice, essentially. Um, that's all I wanted to say. So we're going to, we're going to end with a question, as, and I think I don't, I mean, it would be great to be able to discuss that about whether we, I mean, because that, that is one of the key, and if in, in the RCRC manifesto, it's one of the key issues, and being the response is, is a big industry push. I, we don't have the time to discuss that, but maybe we should discuss that informally now as, as, to, as to what we do about that, because that's quite a provocative point to end on, which I would like, unless anyone's got anything really super quick, because I am going to hand it over to Victoria. Okay, I'm thank gonna, you, I'll, everybody. I'll just take up that conversation in the bar later. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I go back to the, um, the smoke? Yeah. Can, can you do that for me? Yeah, I guess we're outside. Okay, I'm sharing or whatever. <laughs> we don't need this anymore, do we? <clears throat> okay, uh, we're almost there. I just want to say thank you. Um, IRDR Twitter has tweeted, it's been a joy um, hosting the UK Shelter Forum at UCL again. And, you know, I really believe that. It has been so exciting to be back here in person um, hosting everyone again. So thank you for coming. Thank you for um, sticking to the agenda, discussing this really difficult topic. It's been really interesting. Thank you for everyone who's taken part. There's so many people on the agenda. There's so many people who are like behind each of the breakout groups and the preparation and the online support. Thank you to um, Fiona Kelling, who's been on the Zoom chat. Thank you to all uh, Sneha, who um, chaired the online session uh, from uh, about lessons learned. Marta, Eliza, Eva, the coordination around the shelter project, so on, everyone that presented in that group. There's just been an incredible network. Uh, it's been a really incredible event of people in the room and online across the globe collaborating. It's been super lovely. Um, so what happens next is that we try and document all of this. Well, no, the nice hybrid conferencing people are going to chop up the video of today into manageable chunks. We'll upload them to the UK Shelter Forum uh, YouTube and link it from shelterforum.info. So once we've done all that, we'll send you an uh, email with the link and we'll let you know. So everything will be documented. Also, because things were recorded, it means you can watch the sessions that you missed, because I know you all get FOMO, so you can catch up. Um, so if you like today, if you are in London, you might want to come to these other IRDR events. We're having a humanitarian summit on the 15th of June. We're having an annual conference on the 16th of June. Both of those also have a climate change risk reduction uh, theme. Shams, is, <laughs> Shams knows loads more about those than I do. Uh, you can follow IRDR. Uh, I think the second last thing I want to say, is, no, I've got two more things to say. Uh, think about catalyzing a shelter forum in your own country if you're watching online or the country where you're working. So think about catalyzing more shelter forums. Um, uh, and uh, think about who's gonna host the next UK shelter forum. So at this point in the past, we used to look around the room and just sit in silence really until someone put their hand up. <laughs> um, but we could do this also in the pub. So just put that out there. Um, <laughs> then fine yeah exactly everyone points at each other for a bit until someone says all right then um final point i think is let's go to the bar but before you leave the room visit the publications table because there are loads of publications still pick them up take them away visit the cake table because the <laughs> cake arrived really late <laughs> then please leave the room by this exit and the brilliant students will show you where the bar is. Essentially, it's right above us. There's a student bar with a roof terrace. It's really lovely. Come and join us there. Okay, and don't move just yet because I'm going to. I will show you where the bar is. But can we all just give this fantastic lady a round of applause? <laughs>